Today's video is brought to you by Sheath Underwear, which is completely revolutionizing the men's underwear game. Look, gentlemen, how many times have you been out of the town and things are just not going well, you know, down below. It's either too hard, skin's getting stuck to skin, maybe it's just too sweaty, and you know, readjusting yourself and your pants in public is just not a good look. Fortunately, there is sheath underwear, which is specifically built with you in mind. It's got three individual compartments in it to keep everything cool and comfortable, including an inverted kangaroo pouch for your, uh, your little Joey. It was invented by a literal US Army soldier when he was in Iraq because, you might have heard, it gets pretty hot there. Trust me, modern underwear that is ergonomically designed for the shape of your body is something that you just have to try. There's less chafing, there's less sticking, and uh, less smelling because of all of that stuff. So if you're still buying your underwear from the same brand that makes your socks, your undershirts, and your sister's bra, maybe it's time to give something a little more personalized to try. Right now, you guys can get 20% off sheath underwear by clicking the link below and using the code BRAINFEED at checkout. Alternatively, you can go to sheathunderwear.com forward slash BRAINFEED. It's the same deal. 20% off. Do that and you're dry. Comfortable balls will thank you. Again, sheathunderwear.com forward slash BRAINFEED or just click the link below for 20% off. And now today's video. These days, it seems that movie theaters will try just about anything to lure viewers away from the comfort and convenience of television and streaming, from 3D releases to giant IMAX screens to 4D seats that shake and rock along with the on-screen action. And as theaters struggle to recover from the massive hit in attendance caused by COVID-19, such gimmicks are likely to become even more prevalent in the future. But this is nothing new. Back in the 1950s, as the newfangled technology of television made its way into ever more American homes, the film industry turned ever more to elaborate gimmicks to get butts in theatre seats, from wraparound Cinerama screens to 3D films to special seats that jolted audience members during moments of high tension. But perhaps the strangest gimmick of all was a system that pumped various scents into the theatre in an attempt to better immerse viewers in the film. This is the story of the brief rise and fall of smell o vision The use of scent to enhance storytelling predates the use of sound in film, and indeed the art of film itself. Ancient Greek plays often made use of incense or fresh flowers to build atmosphere, while 19th century dramatists sometimes scattered pine needles to evoke the scent of a forest or cooked food on stage to create the ambience of a kitchen or restaurant. While this might seem like nothing more than an elaborate gimmick, there is a solid scientific justification for using smell to enhance immersion. Evolutionarily speaking, smell is one of our oldest senses, and the one most tied to memory and basic emotions such as fear, disgust, joy, and sadness. This is why a single odor can unleash a flood of powerful memories, and why artists through the ages have sought to harness the power of scent to evoke the desired emotions in their audience. The first recorded use of scent enhancement in a movie theater was in 1906, when the owners of the Family Theater in Forest City, Pennsylvania, piped the scent of rose oil into the auditorium during a newsreel about Pasadena's Rose Parade. In 1916, the Rivoli Theater in New York also released floral scents during the screenings of the short film Story of Flowers, while in 1929, Fenway Theatre in Boston used lilac perfume to enhance the romantic drama Lilac Time. That same year, the New York premiere of the Broadway Melody, one of the first Hollywood musicals, was accompanied by perfume sprayed from the ceiling. However, these early attempts were one-off stunts implemented by individual theater owners and rarely incorporated more than one or two thematically relevant scents released during the show. It would be another decade before fully scent-integrated films finally became a reality. And the mastermind behind this would-be cinematic revolution was a curious 40-year-old Swiss inventor named Hans Laub. Born in Zurich in 1900, Hans Laub was the spitting image of the Germanic mad scientist, with round black eyeglasses and an obsessive, fastidious nature. Relatively little is known about the man who at various points in his life identified himself either as a professor, electrical engineer, advertising executive, and an expert in cosmology, the science of odors. According to one story, in the mid-1930s, Laub invented an air purifier to clear cigarette smoke and other odors from large auditoriums and became fascinated with the notion of reversing the process and returning the smells into the theater. This led to a lifelong obsession with scents and the emotions that they could trigger. Around 1939, Laub invented a system called Centivision, which could pipe 32 different scents, including roses, tar, peaches, and coconuts through hoses built into each theater seat. The system was manually operated by the projectionist, who released the appropriate scents at key points throughout the film. To promote the technology, Lau produced a 35-minute short film called Mein Traum, or My Dream, which was exhibited at the 1939 New York World's Fair. While some viewers complained that a few of the artificial scents, most notably that of bacon, were less than convincing, 
Reviews of the experience were generally positive, with the New York Times reporting, Centivision produces odors as quickly and easily as the soundtrack of a film produces sound. Yet despite the inherent novelty of Centivision, Laub failed to interest many Hollywood producers or theater owners in his invention. Walt Disney briefly considered integrating Centivision into his 1940 animated musical Fantasia, but ultimately decided against it for reasons of cost. There were scattered attempts throughout the 1940s to integrate sense into films, such as in 1943, when a theater in Detroit used smells such as tar and salt air to enhance the Errol Flynn swashbuckler of a Seahawk. Also on the bill was the Western Boomtown, in which each actor was given the olfactory equivalent of a musical leitmotif. Tobacco for Clark Gable, pine for Spencer Tracy, and perfume for Hedy Lamar. But it would not be until the 1950s that the movie industry would truly be ready for Hans Laub's odiferous vision. As previously mentioned, in that decade, growing competition from television forced movie studios and theater owners to come up with ever more elaborate gimmicks to get viewers into movie theaters. At first, such efforts focused on creating an epic, immersive experience that television simply could not recreate. Among the first such technologies was Cinerama, which used three separate projectors to fill an entire extra-wide curved screen, filling the audience's field of vision and creating the illusion of total immersion. Introduced in 1952, Cinerama was mainly used for travel logs and historical epics such as 1955's Cinerama Holiday and 1962's How the West Was Won. However, the equipment needed to film and project Cinerama proved prohibitively expensive and technically challenging to use, and only a handful of films were ever produced in this format. A similar widescreen effort was later achieved more economically with a single projector system such as 70mm Panavision, CinemaScope, and of course, IMAX. The 1950s also saw the golden age of 3D films, starting with 1952's Buona Devil, a film about man-eating lions in Africa, whose promotional tagline touted the experience as a lion in your lap, a lover in your arms. Throughout the decade, films ranging from the 1954 Alfred Hitchcock thriller Dahl M for Murder to the 1955 Andre de Toth horror movie House of Wax would exploit the 3D effect to varying degrees of success, with plenty of objects like trains, weapons, or in the case of House of Wax, a paddleball shot to appear as though they were coming straight at the audience. But the novelty quickly wore thin and could not compensate for the lower image quality of most films shot in 3D. Theatres also found it difficult to persuade audience members to return their cardboard 3D glasses, cutting significantly into profits. By the 1960s, the first wave of 3D films had all but died out. But the undisputed master of outrageous cinema gimmicks was B-movie director and producer William Castle, known throughout Hollywood as the King of Ballyhoo. Castle was infamous for integrating elaborate props into his film screenings, such as swinging a glow-in-the-dark skeleton through the theater at the climax of 1959's House on Haunted Hill, or giving audience members special illusiono glasses that allowed them to see the invisible ghouls in 1960's 13 Ghosts. But perhaps Castle's most outlandish vision was his so-called Percepto format, specifically created for 1959's The Tingler. The plot for the film revolves around a parasite that wraps itself around the human spinal cord and can only be defeated by screaming. At the climax of the film, electric motors built into the theater seats would give audience members a jolt of vibration as on-screen actor Vincent Price urged them to scream, scream for your lives. This period of freewheeling showmanship and experimentation created the perfect conditions for the triumphant return of Hans Laub and Centovision. In the mid-1950s, Laub finally found a patron in producer Michael Todd, known for his bombastic, larger-than-life productions on both stage and screen. Todd initially considered integrating Centovision into his epic 1956 adaptation of Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days, but ultimately decided against it. And while Todd tragically died in a plane crash in 1958, his son, Michael Todd Jr., remained fascinated with the potential of Centervision and signed Laub to a movie deal on the one condition that the name be changed to Smellervision. When an indignant Laub asked why he didn't change the name to something more dignified, Todd replied, I don't understand how you can be dignified about a process that introduces smells into a theatre. Laub had improved the Smellervision system since its 1939 debut, integrating what he called a smell brain. No longer did the projectionist have to queue up each scent manually. Instead, the vase of scent were mounted on a belt looped around a pair of feed reels. Optical markers on the film cued the belt to advance through the machine, ensuring that each scent was delivered at the right moment. 
Still, Todd and Laub recognized that Smellovision had limitations. The system, they realized, would not mesh well with heavy affair like dramas or romances, so for the first Smellovision feature, they produced a light-hearted comedy whodunit titled Scent of Mystery. Starring Denholm Elliott, Elizabeth Taylor, and Peter Law, Scent of Mystery centers on a photographer on vacation in Spain who stumbles upon a plot to murder a beautiful heiress. With the help of a drunken cab driver, he embarks on a madcap chase across the Spanish countryside to thwart the crime. Unlike previous scent-enhanced films, Scent of Mystery used scent as an integral storytelling device, with the off-screen presence of certain characters being telegraphed by the release of particular smells like tobacco smoke or perfume. Smell was also used to add humor. For example, in one scene where Elliot and Law's characters are drinking coffee, Law smells suspiciously like it has been spiked with brandy. With his trademark flair for over-the-top promotion, Michael Todd Jr. touted Scent of Mystery and smell of vision as the next great advance in filmmaking technology. The film's posters proclaiming that, first they moved, 1895, then they talked, 1927, now they smell! But before Todd and Laub's revolutionary new film could make it into cinemas, it was beaten to the punch by 1959's Italian travelogue Behind the Great Wall, which at its premiere at the Mayfair Theatre in New York was accompanied by a suite of a hundred different aromas including grass, earth, seawater, burning gunpowder, and incense. These scents were delivered via a system called Vice Rodia Scent Screen, invented by public relations executive Charles H. Vice, which released odors not through specially built pipes in the seats, but rather the theatre's air conditioning system. The scents themselves mixed with a quick evaporating freon base, while the system incorporated a special electrostatic filter to quickly remove the scent from the air, preventing them from lingering too long. Reviews of the resulting experience were mixed, with some papers like the Sunday Morning Herald Tribune praising the illusion, saying, Curiously enough, they do not give the impression of being blown in or wafted from any specific direction. Actually, the individual smells simply appear in the nostrils without any effort being made to sniff or strain for them. And what is more remarkable, each individual odor disappears promptly when the image smelled leaves the screen. There is no question about its effectiveness in creating illusions of reality. The New York Times was less flattering, with reviewer Bosley Krauser describing the piped in sense as capricious, elusive, oppressive, or perfunctory and banal, merely synthetic smells that occasionally befit what one is viewing, but more often they confuse the atmosphere. Audiences proved indifferent to the gimmick, but behind the great rule, stripped of the accompanying scents became a critical and box office success. Meanwhile, Michael Todd Jr. and Hans Lahr pushed forward with Scent of Mystery, which premiered in three specially equipped theaters on January 12, 1960. Alas, the lukewarm reception of screen scent proved to be an ill omen, for smell vision failed to make the impression that Todd and Laub hoped. Audience members in the balconies noted that the scents reached them several seconds too late, muddling their dramatic impact, while others complained that the puffs of scented air emerging from the delivery pipes were distractingly loud and the scents themselves too faint, with Bosley Crowther writing that patrons sit there sniffing and snuffling like a lot of bird dogs trying hard to catch the scent. The rapid-fire aromatic salvo also prevented viewers' noses from resetting between scents, resulting in an effect known as olfactory fatigue that caused all the various smells to blend together into meaninglessness. The film itself was hardly better received, with Crowther pithily suggesting that the filmmakers pump laughing gas into the theater to make up for the unfunny script and wooden performances. Comedian Henny Youngman also joins the critical dog pile, quipping, I didn't understand the film. I had a cold. While Laub was eventually able to solve most of the technical issues, it was already too late. Bad press had doomed smell vision to cinematic oblivion. Hans Laub and Michael Todd Jr. disappeared into obscurity. The three smell vision theaters were stripped of their equipment, and Scent of Mystery was re-released as Holiday in Spain. However, as Scent was so intimately woven into the film's storytelling, its absence led to even more confusion among viewers, with the Daily Telegraph noting, The film acquired a baffling, almost surreal quality, since there was no reason why, for example, loaf of bread should be lifted from the oven and thrust into the camera for what seemed to be an unconscionably long time. By the 1970s, the fad for elaborate cinematic gimmicks had died out as a new generation of bold, exciting directors like Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and Francis Ford Coppola spearheaded the renaissance in filmmaking known as New Hollywood. Still, occasional attempts were made to further enhance the cinematic experience. One such system was Sense Around, which made theater seats shake and rock during screenings of the 1974 disaster epic Earthquake. Far more ambitious was the laserdisc-based interfilm system developed by inventor Bob Bajan 
Japan, which allowed audience members to direct the course of a film in real time, choose your own adventure style. Seat armrests were fitted with joysticks, which the audience could use every few minutes to choose between three possible story paths. The films produced using this system were only 20 minutes long, allowing viewers to return for repeat screenings and experience multiple different iterations of the same story. Unfortunately, like many such systems, Interfilm proved prohibitively expensive to implement and failed to draw a large enough audience, and only two films, 1992's I'm Your Man and 1995's Mr. Payback, were produced before Bejan's company folded. Still, the inventive concept anticipated future works of interactive media, like Netflix's 2008 experiment Black Mirror Bandersnatch. Yet, despite the repeated failure of similar gimmicks, Smellovision continued to pop up in one form or another. In 1981, cult filmmaker and self-proclaimed king of bad taste John Waters paired his comedy film Polyester with a variation of Smellovision that he dubbed Odorama. Instead of having smells piped through their seats, audience members were handed a card with ten numbered scratch and sniff discs, each cued by matching numbers appearing on screen. The scents ranged from roses to farts to pizza, but all reportedly smelled vaguely of oregano. While Waters intended the gimmick as a tongue-in-cheek homage to schlock masters like William Castle, the Odorama concept has been copied many times since, such as 2003's Rugrats Go Wild and 2011's Spy Kids All the Time in the World. There have even been attempts to resurrect Hans Laub's original smell vision concept. Hong Kong director Ip Kam Huang's 2000 fantasy romance film Lavender was enhanced via floral scents pumped into the theater's air conditioning systems, while in 2006 select Japanese screenings of Terence Malick's historical romance The New World were accompanied by floral scents for romantic scenes, peppermint and rosemary for sad scenes, orange and eucalyptus for joyful moments, and tea tree oil for angry moments. Several rides at Disney Park also make use of piped in scents such as It's Tough to Be a Bug at Animal Kingdom, Mickey's Magic at Disney World, and Soarin' Around the World at Disney California Adventure. Several companies are currently developing smell release systems that can be plugged into a television or computer, while Vermont-based firm OVR Technology recently introduced the Ion Ascent device for the Oculus Rift virtual reality headset. It just goes to show that, as cynical as we might think we are, we will always be suckers for a novel cinematic gimmick. And so, like a fart in a sofa, the strange lure of smell vision will continue to linger for some time to come.